Right, Tim, over to you. Hi, um, thanks. It's nice to see so many people and um, some familiar faces too. Um, so I'm going to try and talk for about 40 minutes because I suspect there are probably going to be lots of kind of specific questions that I might not address directly. So what I'm going to try and do is give some, I suppose, general starting points and some general things to think about. Um, I'm going to try and talk about three things. And if I don't talk about them here, then I'm also um, preparing some resources that um, Chamber Music Scotland will be sharing. So some video resources and some, I mean, PowerPoint presentations for lack of a better word, but, you know, just some documentation to um, explain some of the things that I'm going to try and get across today. Um, thanks a lot to uh, Paul and the team for asking me to come and do this. Um, I think I want to start by talking a little bit about what I think is um, important when uh, when thinking about a recording and um, I tell all of my students that the most important thing in the recording is the performance and that it's our job, especially I'm, I'm basically going to consider this from a kind of classical music perspective today. I'm going to kind of par park the pop and rock stuff where um, recording technique might be kind of part of the musicality. But um, in classical music, it's it, we're basically trying to uh, capture the performance and to make the, the best of the performance that's there. It's not about trying to, I suppose, overly uh, produce it necessarily. Um, and so there'll be lots of recordings that we all love. I can think of, you know, uh, particular recordings like, you know, the Casals, cello suites um, and other recordings from that era that will be really noisy and um, they'll be crackly and they'll be grainy but we love them because of the performance and because of the sound of that particular performer so I think the most important thing in all of these things that that everyone's trying to achieve is actually to keep keep performing and, and keep being musical and keep playing but if we're going to take that for granted and think a little bit about um, how to make a kind of higher quality audio product, then um, I'm going to think about three things. Um, I'm going to think about microphones and how they work. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the different mic types. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about adapting the sound of a room, but I'm going to probably do more of that in, in a kind of video tutorial that I'll try and get done early next week. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about and demonstrate some tactics for um, mixing, um, particularly when there are some maybe issues in the recording to do with uh, background noise or um, other kinds of problems. Uh, this first bit, I hope, won't be painfully dry, um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the kind of specific characters of different microphone types. So there are four um, types of microphone, and then within that we have kind of sub um, categories of mics. So uh, dynamic microphones, uh, generally they're cheaper and don't sound as good as the other mic types, at least for if we're thinking about recording an acoustic instrument um, for classical music. Uh, they have what's called a shaped frequency response. I'll talk about what that means in a minute. Um, condenser mics are our kind of all-rounders. Um, they generally have what we call a flatter frequency response. So they're going to interfere with the sound of the instrument um, as it exists in the room, probably the least. Um, and they would you know, kind of be called a little bit more natural, uh, or that's the kind of uh, subjective term that people would tend to use. Uh, ribbon microphones um, are very much in fashion at the moment um, and I think it's for the same reasons that um, recording to analog tape is in fashion and uh, releasing audio on vinyl is in fashion. It's because they kind of have a slightly darker um, sound that's maybe a little bit more kind of flattering um, sometimes it's not quite as revealing. Um, I really like ribbon mics, they work really well, um, but then maybe if I was going to buy my first microphone, they probably wouldn't be the choice. 
I'm not going to talk about tube mics, but I just want to kind of acknowledge um, that they exist. Um, they're, they're quite a bit more expensive, and so probably not what we're going to use in a kind of living room or bedroom recording situation, because it would be slightly pointless to use um, that expensive a mic when we've got other, other issues that we can improve first. And I suppose I'm talking about microphones first because um, they're the part of our um, recording setup that is going to make the biggest difference to the sound that we're recording. And their placement is going to make, I suppose, the second biggest difference. Um, when we're thinking about the character of microphones, there are two things, uh, two technical things that are going to influence this. The first is the frequency response. and uh, there are two types of frequency response. There's uh, a shaped frequency response and there is a flat frequency response. Um, a small caveat, there is no such thing as a really truly flat frequency response. Um, all microphones have a character. Um, there is no neutral microphone, no matter what they tell you, in their diagrams and things like that. What a shaped frequency response will do is it will make a more kind of specific sound. So the um, diagram at the top of this slide shows a microphone that is going to kind of boost the high frequencies. Um, so it's going to make uh, the sound brighter, um, which for that particular microphone is designed to help it cut, uh, to cut through a texture. So that's for a handheld vocal mic, uh, a classic mic, uh, the Shure SM58. The mic on the bottom, uh, is designed specifically for recording classical music and so um, has a they advertise it as having a absolutely flat frequency response um, and that would be good for for capturing an orchestra where you don't want to lose like the double basses or the cellos um, when you're working the second technical thing uh, to think about is um, the polar pattern of a microphone. And this is how sensitive a microphone is um, to sound arriving at different angles. Um, on this slide, the diagram on the right is the kind of traditional uh, diagram um, where we see uh, the polar pattern in two dimensions. And this uh, polar pattern is called a cardioid um, because it looks slightly like a heart. Um, or a kind of love heart shape. And uh, these mics are most sensitive at the front, less sensitive at the side, and least sensitive at the rear of the mic. Um, directional mics are useful in terms of making sure that the sound, uh, uh, the microphone focuses on the source. So if you point this microphone at your sound source, whatever that is, then it's going to reject um, some sound at the side and quite a lot of sound from the rear of the mic. It can also be good for limiting the kind of ambient sounds that you're picking up in your recording. The opposite end of this scale is the omnidirectional mic, which is equally sensitive um, from all angles. Um, one interesting thing about omnis and also about any of these mics is actually their polar patterns are never kind of true. Um, they're never a kind of perfect circle or sphere. Um, as the um, frequency um, that the mic is picking up gets higher, a omnidirectional mic will become more directional. So it will start to look a little bit more like this by the time we get to 5000 hertz. And that's a good thing. Um, so one of the things I'm going to try and talk about today is stereo and what's the advantage of stereo. Um, and when when we're listening to a stereo image, our ears decode the placement of a sound uh, between our headphones or between the two loudspeakers by um, uh, listening to the higher frequencies. That's what helps us identify the source of a sound. Um, omnidirectional microphones are really useful because they um, have a flat frequency response um, generally um, even when you move the microphone further away. Um, so directional mics, when you move them further away, uh, they lose low frequency, which is a kind of problem for classical recording. Um, 
the uh, title on this slide should say bi-directional or figure of eight. So this is a bi-directional microphone. And uh, this mic is equally sensitive at the front and the rear and rejects sound at the side. Um, because it picks up from sorry, uh, because it picks up from the rear, um, often you'll find people saying it's it picks up a lot, lot of ambience. But actually, um, in in the demos that I've prepared for um, uh, Chamber Music Scotland, you can hear that the bi-directional mic that I've recorded is really dry sounding um, because it rejects so strongly at the sides. So um, kind of really useful polar pattern in that if you point the side of the mic at the thing you don't want to pick up. Um, that can really help to cut out that sound and focus in on the sound source. Um, singer songwriters, uh, or not singer songwriters, um, vocalists um, who are playing guitar at the same time, you can point the side of the vocal mic at the guitar. So if you point that down at the body of the guitar, then the um, front of the mic will be pointing at the vocalist. And that's a really good way of limiting the spill between uh, the two uh the two uh, so, uh sound sources so you get a bit of control and then you would stick a mic on the guitar in classical music uh this particular kind of mic is really useful in a acoustic that has um really strong reverberations between the sides of the room or the wall of the room and then you would point this microphone straight ahead and it would cut out any kind of side slap or extra reverberation that you're wanting to to deal with um, the fourth uh, common uh, polar pattern is um, called a hypercardioid and this mic uh, or this mic type is even less sensitive at the side but it is slightly sensitive at the rear so th this mic I, I wouldn't use much for recording I would generally use it for live sound um, because it's slightly more focused sounding and it's going to pick up less um, room noise and it's going to pick up less of the kind of player sat next to um, wh whichever sound source you, you're, you're looking at. So if you had, I don't know, two violinists sat one next to another, then um, you might use something like this to, to limit how much of violin two you pick up in violin one's mic. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the behavior of microphones and how the way you point them uh, affects the way that they sound and we talk about having on and on off axis sound. Um, a microphone that is on axis uh, is pointed directly at the sound source and when you do this the microphone will pick up the frequency response that is kind of advertised so when you you look at a mic uh, if you look at its uh, technical uh, specs, then it will advertise a frequency response. But when you come off axis, so when it's not pointing directly at the source, the frequency response will change. Um, usually directional mics will sound brighter, or, or most mics will sound a little bit brighter when they're off axis. Um, when we're working with recording ensembles or, or groups, then the off axis coloration the way that that sound changes becomes a real problem sometimes um, because if we're getting a lot of off axis sound and it's becoming a lot brighter then you can end up with quite a shrill or tinny recording if you're working with one instrument um, it should be pretty straightforward to make sure you keep that instrument on axis and uh, keep the mic pointing at the sound source Does anyone have any questions they want to jump in before I start talking about stereo techniques and how I would apply these to recording a uh, solo instrument? Feel free to either chat, uh, type something in the chat or um, to open up your mic and ask a question. Okay, I'll carry on. Um, so why, why do I want to record in stereo? Um, well, uh, stereo, it will always give us a more detailed sound. It will always give us a richer um, sound image. If we record uh, just one microphone uh, or one audio signal, then what we would do when we mix that is we would send it equally to the left and to the right headphone or to the left and the right loudspeaker. Now, when we're listening on headphones, that's fine because as I move my head, my headphones move with me. So the stereo image won't be uh, affected by that. When I'm listening on loudspeakers, um, 
when I move my head to the left, if I've only recorded one signal, then what will happen is the sound will jump uh, into the left loudspeaker. Even if I move my head very slightly, if I move my head very slightly to the right, it will jump into the right loudspeaker. If we've recorded in stereo, then the small differences between the left and the right signal will mean that the stereo image is much more stable. So if I move my head to the right, the image will generally move, uh, sorry, to the left, will generally move to the left. And if I move my head to the right, it will generally move to the right, but it won't collapse until my head is much further over. So that's kind of important when we're thinking about translating um, to loudspeakers. Tim, sorry, really quickly, there's just a wee question from Sue in the chat. Um, she just yeah. says, we use a Zoom H2N mic recorder. Can this do all of these things? Um, yes. Uh, so uh, a, a handheld recorder um, will, will almost certainly have um, kind of small condenser mics in it. Uh, it's about working out wh how the handheld recorder works, what stereo system it is using. Uh, I think the Zoom H2N just has a kind of forwards arrow on the top of it. I can't remember what stereo system it uses, um, but I'm going to talk a bit about some of the advantages and disadvantages of the different systems. And I'll try and point out if if someone's using something like uh, one of these stereo systems, I'll try and point out not just the negative things, but the kind of positive things and the way that I would um, look to um, make the most of the kit that I've got. So if this is why I want to record in stereo, if it's to do with translation, richness of sound image, detail, uh, what are the options? So the first technique that uh, is generally discussed is called the coincident or XY technique. And um, when we use this, we place two microphones, one on top of another, with them angled at 90 degrees to one another. And uh, the diagram here shows one mic pointing to the right and one mic pointing to the left. And their kind of overlapping polar patterns creates a kind of almost sphere. Um, the coincident technique is uh, commonly used in handheld recorders. So the Zoom uh, H4 and H5 are both kind of by default uh, XY. Um, and there are some advantages to uh, using XY. Um, the uh, spacing, so if you were recording an ensemble, the spacing is really strong when we use um, the XY technique. So you would be able to identify very clearly where the sound source is placed within the stereo image. And you can have a listen to this in, in the video examples I've sent to um, uh, to Paul and the team. What is less good, and this is maybe less of an issue right now, is that you don't get much uh, of a sense of depth within the stereo image. It sounds quite flat and everything kind of sounds like it's just as close as anything else. So if we think about an orchestra where you would have the strings at the front and the winds behind, then the brass and then the percussion, and that's part of the sound of the ensemble, that kind of huge three-dimensional depth on stage, then you, I, I would not jump to this technique to record an orchestra. But to record a solo um, soloist, I think it can work. Um, I'll talk a little bit about applying these techniques uh, in a second. I'll just talk about how they work and then I'll talk about applying them. Um, the second technique to think about is a spaced pair. And this is where two microphones are spaced apart and are pointed straight ahead. Uh, it's also called the AB technique. Um, with this technique, you can use any polar pattern um, in order to, to make a spaced pair. Um, I'm not going to read everything on the slides because you can look at this later. Some advantages to using uh, the space technique is that you get really good depth in the, in the stereo image. So you get that real sense of three dimensional space um, in terms of depth. Um, the bass response, so the pickup of the bass frequencies tends to be better um, with uh, the space technique. Um, some disadvantages, uh, the left to right um, spacing or, or localization tends to be a little bit weaker. So it would be like the strings are generally left, but it's not like if I was recording a string quartet, I would be able to go, okay, I'm gonna point at uh, violin one, violin two, viola and cello. Um, that would 
tend not to work quite so well. Uh, that's a kind of aesthetic choice. Do you want to be able to point at them or do you want to hear them kind of occupying the space? Um, that's where this starts to, I suppose, get a little bit interesting. Um, the third stereo technique is called near coincident. And with this technique, the mics are slightly spaced and they are angled out. Um, there are three specific techniques, ORTF, DIN and NOS. If you want to know about them, um, there are links on uh, this slide if you want to know specifics about them. Um, what's good about this, uh, the near coincident technique is that you get a kind of combination, a kind of compromise between um, spaced and coincident techniques. So the, the left to right imaging is pretty good, not as good as XY. Uh, the sense of space is pretty good, not as good as a spaced pair. But this means you get a kind of quite accurate representation of a space and the ensemble within it. Um, however, let's start thinking about how to record an instrument or a voice or a solo instrument and voice. Um, I'm starting with the example of a trumpet. I think uh, trumpet, clarinet, voice are all really good examples. And um, in this image, uh, I've started with an AB setup. And again, I've done an example of this in, in, the, in the video, so you can hear how this works. Um, if we look at this image, the mics as they are spaced for an AB technique are actually kind of pointing past the trumpet. So if I was going to make a solo instrument recording in an acoustic that is not particularly good, then what I would actually do is uh, angle these microphones in. So this is an AB setup, but with the microphones angled in, so they're pointing at the sound source. And uh, one of the things we said was that the frequency response would improve if we do that. Uh, the XY setup, again, the mics are pointing kind of past the instrument. Uh, the overall pickup, um, uh, the kind of uh, shape of the pickup, does um, kind of point at the instrument, but it's going to point at, at the actual mic is going to point a little bit past. So we're not going to make best use of their kind of sensitivity. And um, there are two things you could do. You could either um, record in mono and angle it so that one mic is pointing at the sound source and kind of compromise that that desire to record in stereo. Or you could think about how you how far away you record. So the closer you record, the more on axis it's going to sound. Um, if we go too close, though, it, it might start to sound a little bit harsh. So that, that that's how I would start to kind of apply these techniques. So think about distance with an XY technique. Think about angle for a space technique. Um, the one that I wouldn't use, and I haven't got a diagram of it because I wouldn't use it. If I was recording a solo instrument in a bad sounding room, I would not be pointing the mics out from the instrument because then we're going to point them at the walls that's going to pick up more of the reflected sound and if the reflected sound isn't very good then it doesn't make sense to try and capture more of that and you would want to capture a more direct sound um my instinct is not to talk about right now recording a chamber ensemble unless anyone is really desperate for me to talk about it because I'm assuming we're not going to be able to do that for a little bit of time. But if anyone would like me to talk about it now, um, otherwise uh, there are some slides that explain um, how stereo techniques would work for recording an ensemble. Um, anyone got a kind of instinct on whether they'd like me to say something about that? Hi Tim, yeah, we've had um, our say um, and cool. case, so brilliant. go ahead. That's totally fine. I now need to get rid of my Zoom chat. Um, I shouldn't have, so I'm just going to stop sharing for a second if I can. There we go. Uh, and get rid of the chat box because that was covering what I was seeing. Um, Okay, so um, again, this is to do with angle of mics and what they're gonna pick up. So uh, the mic we're seeing there is an XY mic and uh, the, the two mics are kind of pointing slightly past the ensemble. So they're maybe not going to be quite as sensitive to the sound kind of within the ensemble. Um, 
With a space pair, I mean, that's slightly too wide, um, probably, that diagram. Um, with a space pair, I wouldn't go much more than 30 or 40 centimetres wide. You could go up to two metres, but that's very specific. And uh, I, I would not advise it for your first chamber ensemble recording. So if our mics are actually placed about kind of half that spacing, then um, we can move them closer or further away. And that's going to change the kind of balance of the ensemble. With a space pair, the stereo image is determined by how long it takes the sound to arrive at each microphone. So the microphone on the left will pick up the first violin before the microphone on the right. And for the cello, it's vice versa. And those time differences tell our ears um, that something is more to the left or the right. Um, using a near coincident technique for something like a string quartet can work really well. Um, so if I was recording a string quartet, then one of the things I would think about is, do I want um, to really focus on the first violin and the cello, or do I want to kind of reach into the inner parts? And that would depend on the style of the repertoire um, and the material. Um, so um, as, a, as a horrible generalization, if we think about the music of uh, Haydn for string quartets, uh, particularly the early stuff, it would tend to be like a kind of violin solo with quite a strong bass part and the inner parts would kind of fill in the texture. And apologies if anyone really wants to massively disagree with that. Uh, when we move on to um, uh, late Mozart and Beethoven, then the individual parts become much more equal in their kind of importance. And so then you might want to actually reach into the ensemble a little bit better. Uh, distance makes a difference when we are thinking about this. So the closer we go to the ensemble, we're, the more we're going to kind of prejudice the instruments at the front uh, because the relative distance of the instruments is quite big. So in this diagram, you can see that the, the kind of line going to violin one is a lot closer than the line going to violin two. If I move the mics further away, then the relative distance is going to be a lot closer. So we're going to get a better balance. Um, the other thing we can, um, I'm going to skip through the slides to um, to this. The other thing we could think about is the height and angle of the microphones. So we've got um, a couple of, um, I don't know if they're clarinetists or soprano saxophonists, but a couple of um, reed uh, players. And with the mic at that height and angle, then it's going to kind of prejudice the front player. If I raise the mic, then it's going to reach better into that second row and uh, get more of that second uh, of, of the second row of the instruments. That's where height starts to come into play. Um, the third thing to think about is angle. Again, if there were more rows of players behind our kind of imaginary two little stick figures, then uh, it's going to reach into that ensemble even more effectively. Um, I think much of what I've said is on these last two slides. Um, some things to avoid, really wide spacings. Don't space your mics much more than 60 centimetres apart. Um, if they're omnis, then 60 centimetres is OK. If they're cardioids, I wouldn't go that wide. Otherwise, you'll start to get what's called a hole in the middle where you get quite a weak centre to the stereo image. I would avoid in bad spaces, um, bad acoustics, very distant placements. So anything more than 50 to 60 centimeters in, in a dry sounding room, you'll either pick up a lot of an undesirable room sound, or if you're using uh, directional mics, then it's gonna sound really thin and nasal. I would also avoid extremely close placements, like less than 20 centimeters away, uh, because the mics will overly focus on a particular range of uh, of the instrument, particularly if it's something like a woodwind instrument, where the sound emanates from the kind of body, not from the bell. Um, so you would want the, the mic to be far enough away that it's kind of picking up an even picture of the whole uh, kind of body of the instrument, rather than, um, you know, pointing it straight in at one finger. Um, of, of the instrument. Uh, the piano is a good example. If you put microphones in, inside a piano and you make them too low and close, then uh, you'll start to bias certain keys over others. And uh, that would obviously be a kind of problem. Uh, if, you, if someone's playing a kind of nice even scale and then suddenly one note sticks out, we're not actually capturing what the, what the player is trying to achieve. Um, some, uh, I mean, this repeats a little bit of what I've just said. Um, 
Let's think a little bit about acoustics. Hey, Tim, sorry, really yeah. quickly, uh, just a wee question in the chat from Kirsty. Um, yeah. She says, do similar avoids apply to mono recording too regarding distance? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think my instinct would be that often I would go just that little bit closer with mono and try to avoid, avoid the room sound even more. And I'm not quite sure why that is. I don't know if it's because when I'm making a mono, I'm normally recording pop music and I want a closer sound or whether it's to do with the kind of l less detail that we pick up when we are recording in um, in mono. It might be to do with that. But I would, I would, yeah, absolutely the same kind of principles of um, if you're in a bad room, avoid the room sound. Um, uh, a lot of, one of the things I should have said at the start, a lot of what I'm talking about might be quite technical, but it's also kind of really not rocket science. It's like, if it sounds good, then it is good. So if you get your instrument sounding good in the room, then that's going to help you really work out um, how to record it. So um, bringing us on to thinking about the acoustic, um, the first thing we need to do is find out a little bit about an acoustic and uh, there are ways to do this um, without having to do anything too fancy. Um, so if you walk around the room that you're in and you uh, clap your hands, but if you try and specifically create different kind of frequencies in your clap, so if you put both palms, to uh, palms together and cross you'll get quite a low frequency sound if you kind of slap them off one another then it'll be much brighter i'm not going to do that so i don't deafen you all um if you click your fingers you're going to get a brighter sound and what you should listen for is how the sound decays um and you should also listen for if there are any kind of buzzes or resonance or or, or flutters so a flutter is where the sound um uh bounces between uh two surfaces really quickly and you hear a kind of sound um and you might not be able to avoid recording in that room, but you might be able to avoid picking up that sound. So I would walk around the room, clapping, clicking, making loud, low noises, maybe with my voice, uh, brighter noises with my voice um, to find out what the room sounds like. And where it sounds good, uh, that's where I would sit or stand to play. Um, I would then think about some of the things I've discovered, maybe there's a flutter in the top left hand corner behind me. So um, then what I would do is I would actually, uh, I think I would face that corner and then I would have the back of the mic pointing at that corner. So the, the rear of a directional mic is gonna reject that uh, fluttering sound. Hey Tim. Yep. Sorry, two more questions about that have just popped up in the chat. Um, we have one from Angela, who's a vocalist, and she's just said, could you clarify what are some qualities of a bad room from the point of view of a performer or the audience, dry versus boomy? Yeah, uh, yeah so um, it, it would be where the, uh, the reverberation isn't balanced, generally, and um, uh, hopefully I'll get some time to talk about this in a second. Um, so if the reverberation is too biased to a certain frequency, then you, what you'll hear is that uh, there's a kind of build up. Um, uh, most of us, as play if we've done any kind of playing in many acoustics, you'll just know if an acoustic suits your instrument or not. Um, certain instruments, I think, or certain kinds of players also uh, really understand it maybe more specifically so something like uh, a french horn or a tuba is really interesting because uh, we we don't really listen to the direct sound of that instrument we listen to the sound of that instrument in the room so the relationship between that instrument and the room is is maybe more important than with some other instruments and i'm not to say that those instruments are more important it's just they're different and they project differently. Uh, so if it was boomy, then you'd have a kind of build up of low frequency. Um, if it was kind of harsh sounding, then you'd have a build up of high frequencies. And if it was just generally unclear, it would probably be a build up of uh, mid frequencies. Um, right, and then so one more question from Catherine. So she said, um, would putting the microphone on a tripod be particularly advantageous? And this is specifically with a Tascam handheld mic. Yeah, so I would either uh, get get it on a tripod or on a, um, a mic stand. So on one of the um, 
uh, s a set of slides I've done. Um, I've, I've included a link to an adapter so you can um, put a handheld recorder on a um, mic stand. And with a mic stand, unless you've got a very, uh, you know, kind of particular tripod, you're probably not going to be able to get it as high as you would a mic stand. Um, so you'd be able to get the, the, the recorder, you know, over an instrument like a tuba, or you would be able to get it um, placed a bit more specifically, maybe even lower if you're recording a cello on a mic stand rather than on a tripod where you're going to be limited with the height. Um, and then, yes, you're going to be able to angle the microphone much more specifically at the instrument. So I would I would either want to get it on a tripod or on a mic stand, uh, depending on what's possible. A few more questions have come in. Um, so it's up to, up to you whether or not you sort of want to wait or go for it. Um, so we've had one that says, um, where would you put the mic for a horn? And she's specifically talking about a Zoom mic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with horn, um, if we're looking to get a kind of direct sound, then um, which is what I would do in in this kind of situation if we were recording in a uh, a less good acoustic. I would go for a direct sound that I would then manipulate a little bit to make it sound like it's a bit more reverberant. Um, what I would do is I would place the mic off the bell. So I would have it at maybe a 90 degree angle to the bell. So I would put it behind the player and then kind of a couple of steps to the left or the right, depending on how how the the particular instrument resonates so it might be a kind of bit brighter on one side or a bit darker on another depending on exactly on the shape of of the bell um and that would be true for a tuba so i would want it to be very slightly off the bell um for any brass instrument actually um because they can tend to sound a little bit unnatural okay and then one more um so would you still favor stereo recording for a solo instrument if the aim is to layer parts together i.e lockdown ensemble playing um depends on what you're trying to achieve and there would be other things to think about um so uh i think if i was doing something multi-tracked um and i hadn't done a lot of multi-tracking i would probably record in mono first and then look to develop my my techniques in stereo there are two ways you could approach stereo you could for each part you could move yourself to a different part of the microphone so that or the or the pair of microphones so that you kind of capture your position in the room relative to the mics and that will create a kind of stereo image when you layer them on top of one another or you can kind of place if you've got uh panners i'll maybe jump into pro tools to show you this but you could pan you know one part a little bit left and one part a little bit right and one part in the middle or something like that and i'll, I'll show you how you would do that in pro tools uh, i think i would start with mono would would be uh the same this kind of safest way to do something good soon right so that's all the questions that were in the chat so Okay, um, so if you're in an acoustic and you've got yourself in the best place and you want to make it a little bit better, um, then uh, there are a couple of things that you could try. Um, so if you search for bedroom recording tactics, how to dry up a vocal in a bad sounding bedroom or whatever, there'll, there'll be lots of stuff about recording pop music that we can kind of steal and apply here. Um, what I would do is start moving big objects around uh, things that are going to change the way that the sound is absorbed in the room. So maybe grabbing something like a mattress and putting it, uh, resting it against the wall, possibly in the corner. So corners are, um, a re they capture bass frequencies really well. So often you can get a kind of build up of low frequencies in a corner. Um, you'll see a guitarist practicing into a corner uh, because it gives them back quite a lot of low frequency. It can be really pleasant um, in a room that's maybe sound a bit harsh. Just go into the corner and actually hear the balance of your instrument. Um, but if you're getting too much bass and you can maybe lean a mattress into that corner and then you would perform in front of the mattress and you would point the mic at the mattress. Um, so again, think about the sensitivity of a mic. It doesn't make sense to put a, uh, a pointer mic away from the mattress because that's the thing that's drying up the room. If you point it back into the room, you're going to pick up more of that reverberation. So point it towards the, the area where you're drying up the sound. Um, the other thing you could think of, um, and let me just uh, see if I can quickly uh, Google something. I forgot to grab a picture of this. Um, uh, Oh, what are they called? So you get these things that go round a microphone and they cut out the sound. Uh, that This must be it. Um, yeah, so something that looks a little bit like this. 
we had a picture before. Um, so you'd put this behind the microphone and that would isolate the sound of um, the rear of the room from the mic. You could do something like that with a pillow. Um, you maybe wouldn't want to get it quite so close because it's going to colour the sound. But if you're finding that the, the, the rear of your mic was sounding really unpleasant, then you could stick a kind of pillow in a kind of U shape around the back of it to maybe manufacture yourself something like that. And any of these things are going to kind of dry up the room a little bit. Um, I'm not going to tell you to get lots of egg egg cartons and stick them on the walls. You'd need hundreds of them um, in order to actually make a meaningful difference. Um, uh, I suppose the big uh, one of the things about acoustics that that is is uh, a problem is if you're in a cube. So if you're in a cube, then the same frequency is going to bounce, uh, or the same frequencies are going to be really prevalent uh, between the roof and the sides of the room, and you'll get a really big build up of a particular frequency and its harmonics. Um, so if you can get in a room that is slightly uh, non-symmetrical then that's going to help you or if you can in in some way make it less symmetrical that's going to help you so again the idea of a mattress in a corner um, as a kind of extra wall that's going to make the room slightly less symmetrical uh, so that's another kind of strategy you might use um, with all of these things I'm going to cover um, some of these things in more detail in, in the videos that I'm preparing for you um, what I would like to do is just talk you through um, a little bit of kind of how I would approach mixing something when it maybe doesn't sound so good. Um, I, I'm not too worried. I'm only going to, I'm going to try to only talk for five minutes um, and Hayley maybe stop me after five minutes because I could talk about this for probably another two hours. Um, but I just want to talk you through a couple of things uh, before we um, end for questions. Um, so the two things I would do in terms of mixing are using a tool called equalization, which will allow us to control the tone of a recording and uh, reverb, which will allow us to um, artificially create resonance. Um, I'm working in Pro Tools, but there are other um, softwares that would allow you to do this that are much cheaper. So um, uh, there's a really good um, uh, program called Reaper, uh, which a lot of composers use. Uh, a lot of sound engineers use um, it's bought by donation and the donation is 50 quid um, and it's really powerful it, it's basically like Pro Tools but uh, much cheaper um, but I I had a quick look in Reaper and some of the plugins were slightly less straightforward to demonstrate so that's why I chose to come back into Pro Tools um, I'm going to start with some recordings uh, or with a recording made in a bar. So one of the people I work for quite a bit is uh, Matthew Whiteside. And this is one of the recordings we did uh, for the night with. And this was with uh, Garth Knox. And um, I should say thanks to Matthew for permission for using these. I'm going to start by listening to the silence before the, uh, the music starts. I'm just going to make sure I've defaulted that. So you should be able to hear now some background noise and then a little bit of Garth plucking the strings and then he's going to start playing uh, or he would if I wasn't looping that little section. Um, if I turn this back down so I don't deafen anyone, uh, if I play from the start of this, you know, uh, the question is how much are we aware of it or not? I'm not hugely aware, but there's enough of it there that I feel like I could make an improvement to this. And there are two uh, things to look at. So I I talk a lot about how this, this particular kind of plugin works. So forgive me for not explaining every dial that I'm going to use. But if you want to take a look at the videos that I've shared with, with Paul and the team, then, then you'll get a, a, a kind of technical description of all of this. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to boost the low end. And I'm going to try and identify where this low frequency is. So I do that by kind of sweeping through the frequency content so we can hear brighter and there's all of that low frequency that's kind of covering over our viola de more sound. So I can reduce that a little bit. The other kind of filter I can use is called a high pass filter. Uh, so a high pass filter lets the high frequencies through and cuts out the low frequencies. 
And the way I would apply a high pass filter is I would turn it up until the point I can hear it starting to affect the sound of the instrument. Uh, so let's have a listen to the actual instrument. So if I take this off, you can hear there's lots of richness in that sound. If I add the EQ back in, I've taken out a lot of that kind of the low strings and the resonance of the instrument. That's a real shame. Uh, so I would gradually pull the high pass filter down towards the low frequencies until the point I can't hear it affect the kind of core sound of the instrument. And that's going to help me to pull out some low frequency without ruining the sound of the instrument itself. So if I now bypass that, so we can't hear the EQ plugin working, we get that low frequency back. If I turn it back on, the background sound of the room suddenly becomes less present and we can focus on the kind of clarity of the instrument itself. So if I was going to make one kind of EQ move on a recording, then I would start with uh, a high pass filter and then look at any other low rumble that I, I can cut out. You know, this is going to help with traffic noise um, if you're living in a kind of built-up area where there's traffic, uh, aeroplanes, uh, if, you, if you're under a flight path, path. It's not going to fix it, but it's going to make it more usable. Um, the last thing I want to give you a kind of whistle-stop tour of is um, reverb. And again, I go into this in quite a bit of detail in the videos, but I just want to give you my basic kind of strategies. Um, so uh, this is another of the recordings that I did for Matthew. So this is a viola and accordion duo. And um, there are three things I'm going to control here. I'm going to control um, the kind of color of the reverb. So whether it's bright, dark, or kind of natural and not really influencing the recorded sound. I'm going to control how long the reverb is. So that's going to tell me how big the space is or not, or tell my ears and I'm going to control how much of the reverb we are picking up. So I'm going to start by having only reverberant sound and that's going to let me listen to the color of the reverb. If we have a listen to this track just at this point there's some really low, lovely low stuff in the accordion. So it goes right down into its bottom octave if I add a dark reverb, so a reverb that's got a kind of dark colour, this is going to make the low end a bit, bit too congested. So firstly, there's way too much reverb, but um, when we, if you listen to that low end, then suddenly it's become a bit too kind of busy. If I use a kind of light reverb that's going to be a bit brighter, um, what I found when I was working on this before was that actually I felt like the bottom register of the uh, the accordion became disconnected from the upper register. And that's really focusing on the on, on the really beautiful upper harmonics of the instrument, but also on uh, the kind of uh, on the viola, but not not really kind of gluing the whole thing together. So in the example that I show in, in the tutorial video, I ended up using the kind of natural reverb. And then I would control the length of this reverb. And basically what I would want is for the reverb to decay roughly in time with the music. So if it's a slower piece, you can probably get away with a slightly longer reverb. Um, this would all change if I was doing a whole album. If I was doing a whole album, I'd want the whole disc to have the same reverb. I wouldn't be changing it. But if I was doing a disc, I would be doing it in situ in a concert hall. And so the players would be adapting to that ambience. Um, so if we listen to this with a slightly less of the reverb in the mix, we'll be able to hear how long the kind of decay of the reverb is. And that decays away kind of roughly in time with the piece. If I make it a little bit shorter, uh, 
And if it decays away roughly in time with the, the kind of temper of the piece, then what you'll find is that the reverb trail will be out of the way before the kind of next kind of attack or the next big attack. And uh, this is maybe more of a technique for pop music mixing, uh, where the, the kind of rhythm of the piece is going to be much more predictable. But we can maybe steal this for our kind of at home recordings. Some ballpark figures though for reverb length if you want it to sound like it's in a concert hall then you want between one and three seconds of reverb if you want it to sound like it's in a church or a cathedral then you want kind of between three and five seconds and then your mix setting you want that to be somewhere between 10 and 30 percent so 10 might be a little bit too little for this recording So as I boost that a little bit higher, that felt a little bit more ambient and a little bit nicer to me. Uh, other material won't be able to take uh, such a high mix setting, it'll start to sound muddy. So these are the kinds of things to listen out for when you're when you're making uh, EQ and reverb choices. And like I said, I, I think um, the tutorials should be pretty clear and hopefully you can get um, plenty out of those. Uh, do send me feedback if you feel like there are any things that could be clarified or examples that um, you would want more of. And I will stop talking there and see if anyone's got any questions. Um, so just before you start the sort of, I guess this will be starting the Q&A, um, we have a question from Kim in the chat. Um, yeah. So she says, uh, Tim, can you recommend some decent headphones on a budget? Um, I think with a lot of folks recording setups at the moment, a lot of people will be using headphones for monitoring. Um, using good headphones is really crucial to hearing a lot of the noise we might not be aware is there in the background when you're recording at home. I would suggest our crucial part of your home recording kit to make sure you're getting recorded sound you want. Yeah, monitoring is uh, almost the most important part of being a recording engineer, being able to hear what you're actually putting out into the real world. Um, I really like for budget headphones, the uh, Audio-Technica ATH range. Um, I'll make sure I stick them on the uh, technical um document that uh, I'll, I'll send out um so anything from the ath 20s up i really like the 40s um i use those as kind of um when i'm doing remote recording i use those as the ones that i give my clients to listen on so i feel like they're kind of good enough to give a really good representation but um the ones i'm using cost way too much for me to have multiple pairs um so yeah the audio technica series i think um, right, so does anybody have any questions they want to ask Tim? You don't have to type them in the chat anymore. You can use the hand raise function because I'm currently monitoring it. So if you raise your wee hands, I will be able to see that. Oh, Kim is raising her physical hands in the video. <laughs> I'll just stop sharing screen so I can see people. Um... I'm sorry, I thought it meant physical hands. I don't know if I no, there's a little hand raise <laughs> function that you can do in the <clears throat> if you click the participants view, but physical yeah. um, hands work as well. So no, go for I'm it. Not Kim. Savvy. Um, Kim, this is so amazing. Like the work that you put into this is just so great. Thank you so much. Um, no problem. I had a, a question um, that was about gain structure, and I was wondering if you could just talk through um, a little bit about importance of especially like um because i know it's something that i've got caught out with using especially using zoom and like handheld recorded devices is like how from like the beginning like how you would go about setting and testing your game structure and how important that is when you're passing yeah. that onto someone else potentially to mix and also yeah. like i think a lot of people are like recording separate parts at home and then one person is then getting them together and you've probably got lots of different levels of recording and things. So yeah, do you have this any is, advice for people in terms of how to... This is such a good question and um, to take this right to the top level, so if we're working in some audio software like Pro Tools or Reaper, um, Logic, GarageBand, then the plugins will have a kind of level that they like to receive. So this is where gain structure so when we're working in uh, the digital domain, in, in theory, gain structure shouldn't be as much of a problem as when we were working with tape. I say we as though I actually ever got to work with tape, but because tape had a kind of hissy noise floor, you wanted to send as much signal to the tape so you didn't get too much of the hiss. 
if we're working at 24 bit, then we don't really need to worry about the noise floor in quite the same way that we did because it's so low relative to the signal. Um, but a lot of the plugins are expecting much the same kind of level that you would have sent to analog tape. So it actually, you can end up with better sounding mixes if you send them a, if you send a little bit less signal into your plugins. Um, so that's the kind of top level of where this uh, where of why I'm going to recommend what I recommend. If I jump back into Pro Tools and I just show you what I have with um, these recordings, um, one of the kind of big changes in my practice recently was I started. Um, to try to get my levels to always peak at around about minus 20 and then the body of the sound will be about minus 30. So on this, uh, I'm circling on the screen the meters uh, for the track we're going to listen to. And alongside the meters, there's a scale and you would get this on a zoom recorder, you would get this on a any handheld recorder or any other kind of thing. So when I press play, When uh, he reaches down to that kind of, I don't know if it's double, triple uh, stop at the bottom of that kind of accented note, um, then the meters just peaked just around about here at the minus 20. In, in Pro Tools, that will generally just go like, it will be almost just turning to the light yellow. Um, so on, on something like a zoom, I would aim to get the, the level speak uh, before the orange. So I wouldn't want it going up to the orange and definitely not the red. If I was going to mix something that someone had sent me that had higgledy piggledy levels, then the first thing I would do is I would just make them all the same. Um, so I'd start by bringing them all into the same ballpark just by adjusting the overall level of an individual track. Um, and I wouldn't do that with the fader because that controls the output, not the input. And if I was in Pro Tools, then I would add a, another kind of plugin called a trim. Um, and what a trim is, is it's just a volume control. And it's just going to allow me to add or subtract level to, to the sound. So I'd then just get everything, uh, so every instrument peaks at minus 20 and then I would work from there. Otherwise uh, you you could end up with a kind of, not a car crash, because uh, we're all musicians, but you would end up with your faders in kind of quite different places and sort of wonder, is this okay or is this not okay? Um, and one thing to bear in mind as you become more advanced is that the faders are most sensitive around about the zero number here. Um, the sensitivity down here, it's much more dramatic, the changes. So you want to keep your faders around about zero. Um, does that fully answer your question, Kim? Yeah, that was great. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, just, just understanding a bit about, um, I think that's always something that still even now, like I, I record music, but sometimes I'm still a little unclear, like what, what level I should be recording, things like that, different things and um, show you the the levels in different ways, I guess. Well, thanks, Peter. Thank yeah, so um, just to give a, a definition of um, of gain structure, for, for those who haven't heard the, the term before, gain structure is how we manage our signal levels through the signal chain. So if our chain starts at our microphone and then goes to the microphone input and then into uh, your software maybe, and then you might have an EQ plugin, uh, reverb plugin so it's how the how the signal level in terms of strength changes through those uh, different elements and and almost all of those plugins will have an input and an output control so that you can adjust it so if you make a big change with an eq you might want to just either turn up or turn down the output of that so that you you re-equalize or you balance up the level so that the input is the same as the output once you're done with all of your changes um, Sue's asked, is that the main issue with something like acapella? So um, that's a really good question. So uh, it depends on what mic you're using. Um, probably the biggest issue with that is if you're using like the built-in mic of either a phone or an iPad, the phone will have, uh, the, the microphone will have um, uh, two things. Uh, it won't have a, uh, a level control, so we can't tell it where it should peak so something like a horn is going to distort that app really quickly um even a, a violin if you place it pretty close to the uh, close to the instrument is going to distort it um uh the second thing is it will have auto gain correction now what auto gain correction does is it kind of follows the level of the sound it goes oh it's gone quiet i'll turn it up oh it's got loud i'll turn it down oh it's gone quiet i'll turn it up and so you get this kind of oh, it, it makes me feel a bit seasick when it's really bad uh, you get this kind of it just evens everything out and 
again, I, I think everyone here is a, a classical musician in, in some way, shape or form. And uh, dynamic is so important in what we do. And and, and this app is stealing our dynamics, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, so I, I've not used acapella. It, it, I probably should because people are asking me about it. I should probably have a go. But I'm just actually not a good enough player to do anything meaningful anymore. Um, uh, but but maybe I'll make that a task to see if I can make acapella sound good. I mean, there are people who do who do really good stuff or who are actually maybe imitating the acapella app. And so they're getting someone to do video editing to make it look like acapella, but they're maybe recording it slightly more sophisticatedly. Uh, I saw a really, really good big band recording. And one of the things that was good about that was because with a big band, even if uh, the mics are distorting a bit and it sounds a little bit thin actually you don't want the trombones to sound too thick otherwise they're going to cover over the reeds um and you want everything to kind of sit within its own space in the orchestration so actually having a slightly thinner sound is maybe going to help you do that um and and that was a kind of really interesting uh, little mix task that someone had done that, that was really impressive um, I, i've oh, seen a question yeah. from from simon saying that he's got a u87 um, which is a Neumann mic um, and what would be a good mic to use in stereo with this. So if if you're working with a, uh, a stereo technique, any of the stereo techniques I talked about, you should really be using a matched pair. Um, well, not necessarily a matched pair. A matched pair is something that's come from the factory and the factory tell you that they're identical and they sound exactly the same and so they'll create a really coherent stereo image. You should at least be using another U87 unless you use a very specific um, stereo technique called mid-side. And with mid-side, you point uh, the side of a figure of eight mic at the sound source and then you stick any other microphone over the top of that mic. So if... Uh, have I got anything? So if... Um, if this is my other mic and then my side mic would kind of uh, point this way and that way and through doing some kind of voodoo magic which um, I can happily email out some information about uh, you can create a kind of phantom left and right from the figure of eight mic um, that's I think the only way that you could create a convincing stereo image using not matched microphones uh, at least in terms of make and model um the big issue with the mid side technique is because the the side mic is what's going to give you your ambience you don't want that to be too weak um we're then pointing a microphone at the sides of the room and so if your room doesn't sound really good then the ambient sound is going to sound uh quite poor um so I know that's maybe not the answer you wanted um, in terms of, oh, you could pair it with this mic or that mic. If the mics are too different, then you're going to end up with it just sounding a little bit lopsided. You, you could try any other mic and see if you can balance up the levels. What I would be listening for is, does the guitar sound like it's centered within the stereo image? Does it sound like it's kind of solid uh, solid sound between the, the headphones or loudspeakers? Um, that's what I would try. So I hope that gives you some things that you can have a go at. Does anyone else um, have any? Karen so has her wee hand raised. Oh, hi, Karen. Oh, hello. Um, yeah, my question follows on actually, uh, probably from Suze. So I'm using, just for simple videos, um, my iPad with GarageBand set up for my mic. And I don't even know what my mic is. I stole it from my husband. Nice. It's there for that. Um, Excellent. And then, um, but what I'm finding is if I record flute, it doesn't distort. It's fine, even up in the high register. If I record sax, as soon as I go up into the high register, it's distorting. So I've tried playing about with mic placement mm -hmm. to no avail. Um, is there like something obvious or is it just does because... It, does it have a level control on the front? Uh, yes, it does. It has a V. Um, right. Have you tried turning it all the way down? No. Didn't okay so obviously. so so um uh it, it's it's not so obvious because you know if you're thinking about headphone levels if you turn it all the way down then you get nothing yeah. but we're actually we're talking about microphone signal strength and okay. so uh something like a drum kit would often um have too much level for any domestic uh microphone amp and would distort 
even with your level at the lowest. And so you get things called pads on some mics where it takes out like uh, 10 dB or 20 dB of level. Um, or some mic pre's will have a pad on them where you can take out 10 dB of level. So don't don't be scared to turn your levels right down to the bottom. If, it, if it's distorting, it's distorting. So um, yeah, uh, try and get your levels so they're peaking about minus 20 on the meters and, and that might fix it, I hope. Thank you. And does anybody else have any questions? Are there any any yeah. topics that I haven't talked about at all that you would like me to see if I can do something quick to prepare um, for? Really quickly, um, Tim Angela has just raised her hands. Go ahead, Angela. Hi. Um, I guess in general, if you just have because of lockdown, we I just have a hodgepodge of equipment that people have given me or have sat in the cupboard. Um, and mostly, you know, I have been just making videos on my phone and sending it to my friends and we've been layering on iMovie, that sort of thing. And just to make it line up is good enough. And I'm like, press play, post it, see you later. Mm -hmm. Um, or just singing to my phone, but I'm just singing from like, uh, 15 feet away with the hodgepodge of equipment that I have. Uh, one's like a gamer favorite microphone. Um, and I have one from my, like some sort of thing where I guess he sort of records, but he's more of a pianist and he just wants to listen to his own like piano thing. So there's like, I don't know how you would suggest being able to use this equipment that I'm just not used to doing because I'm just used to singing into people's faces. <laughs> so how would you recommend that we I research or try to kind of consolidate that for certain projects. I'm just thinking online. So we're not, I'm not constantly like, I just pressing play on the video on my phone. Okay. So, um, I suppose the first thing I would look at is, um, can you get signal from these bits of kit into whatever software you're using to record? So if it's acapella or anything else, then, um, see see if you can get it plugged uh, see if you can get that bit of kit plugged in so maybe you'll probably need to use a computer rather than a phone maybe so if you had a laptop with a webcam then you could plug um if you've got a usb if it's like a usb mic then you could plug that into your computer and then maybe you could kind of sit it on the mic stand uh, not the mic stand the music stand if it's uh, if it's like a, a kind of gaming microphone or if it's a headset or whatever and and then just start to experiment uh, i suppose one of the other things that i meant to talk about is um some of you might have mics that, that might be quite nice mics that you use for live sounds, so like if you do sessions or if you play in like rock and pop or trad as, as kind of stuff on the side. And if you've got a good mic that sounds good for live stuff, then actually you can probably use that for recording just as well. You just might want to get it a little bit further away. So I'm thinking about things like um, uh, DPA um, who have kind of, sort of seem expensive mics but when you compare the price to um other microphones so something like uh the dpa 4099 uh which would tend to come with a kind of couple of mounts um one would be a kind of clip so for brass and uh and uh saxes you'd get a clip that would clip onto the bell but you could clip that onto a mic onto onto the music stand and then use the music stand as your kind of mic stand um with the uh dpa 4099 uh not the 4099 uh the 4060 series uh i fingers crossed these guys sell them um these are the ones that a lot of um string players use um you get little mounts that that go just behind the bridge um again they have these uh little mounts that i'm just kind of highlighting here um that you can stick onto things so you could again stick that onto a music stand and just kind of point it generally at your instrument or you could find a way to kind of dang if you're a string player dangle it over over your instrument maybe um as some if you've got a mic stand you could have that and just dangle the mic over it um so kind of be creative with if you've got actually a nice mic um then a nice mic is a nice mic um it doesn't matter if it's in theory for recording or not 
Um, Simon asked about uh, getting rid of or blocking ambient noise in uh, this case birdsong so I think uh, the first thing I would try to do is identify where the sound mostly comes from so if it's from the front or the back of whichever particular room and then I would make sure I pointed the null so the not sensitive side of the mic at the the offending sound um then uh, i think that's that that would be my first strategy and then keeping the mic close so the the closer you place the mic the less you're going to be aware of the background noise because of the kind of sensitivity of the, sensitivity of the mic so if it's picking up more direct signal um you will end up turning your gain control down and uh, so therefore you'll turn down the background sound relative to the um the direct sound of the instrument Danielle. Hi, Anne. Um, so I had a question, it kind of maybe refers back to what um, you and Kim were saying about headphones. Um, so I've just kind of got a mic from a tuba, just a, a ribbon mic with a SE X1R, just kind of the most basic one <laughs> I can find. Yeah. Um, so I've started kind of recording with it and I've just uh, started trying to layer some things on Ableton. and. Um, so I've kind of got get things to the point where to my very untrained ear when it comes to editing sounds okay, I, you know, I'm kind of happy with what I've done with it. Um, I wondered if um, the equip, how much the equipment you use um, affects the way you sound things because I, I hear things because I kind of have this fear that I'm going to send it on to whoever I'm sending it to and it's going to sound different um, on whatever they're listening to. So I wondered if the, if you should adapt the way you edit things as well if, if it's going to be listened to on a phone or a tablet or a laptop or through good speakers or good headphones, bad headphones. Uh, I don't know if you have any advice on that. Yeah, um, so, so so what we're talking about here is the last, or what would traditionally be the last stage of the recording process. It's called mastering and it's, for me, a bit of a black art and lots of mastering engineers don't really talk about what they do. Or if they do, they talk about the gear that they have and the room that they have. And so what we're talking about here is translation. How does a mix translate from one device to another? Um, in terms of monitoring, I would want to make sure that my monitoring was as flat as possible. So I wouldn't use headphones that have a bass boost for mixing or, or monitoring, um, because obviously that's going to introduce extra bass frequency. Now. If that's what you've got and that's what you've got for the foreseeable, the strategy I would take is to to import into your session um, lots of recordings that you like the sound of and you would like your recording to sound like. And every now and then just make sure you listen to little bits of those recordings and compare things like, you know, kind of how much bass frequency is there, how much upper frequency is there, how much mid frequency is there, how much reverb. Uh, what's the dynamic like? Am I at roughly the same level in terms of dynamic? Um, so that you can start to, it's called referencing, so that's a reference track. And so by comparing to some some kind of industry, I hate the idea of industry standards, I really do. But uh, by comparing to other people's mixes that you respect and you like, you can start to kind of come up with strategies for getting around um, uh, equipment that maybe is a little bit biased. Um, does that give you some, some things to try? Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Brilliant. And anybody else have any questions? We do have lots of resources as well that we're going to be sending you. So, um, I'm sure if you can't think of anything now and you do later, um, they'll be covered by all of Tim's wonderful resources that we'll be sending out. Anybody? Great. That's it, Tim. Do you have any sort of final words? Uh, just, I suppose, uh, one of the things that I always forget to say um, when, when I'm teaching kind of more formally at the conservatoire is um, be playful. Try things. Um, learn through failure. Um, find, find out what sounds bad in order to find out what sounds good. Um, uh, I think, uh, yeah, I can tend to be a little bit conservative in the way that I use technology sometimes because I think my background was mostly in um, classical music certainly when I'm recording when I'm when I'm composing then I try and break things all the time and I'm not quite sure why I don't bring that over into my uh, recording practice more um, but yeah tr try try things you think aren't going to work um, 
uh, if you if you want to do something more experimental, then then break all these rules that I've just given you and point microphones in strange directions in order to make it sound thin and uh, and harsh. Maybe if that's what you want to achieve. Um, and yeah, I mean, my for me, mic placement is the musicality of um, recording, um, and and that's why I probably spoke about it for a little bit longer than I really meant to, but. If you, there's a kind of um, rude saying uh, that, that translates in not rude to garbage in, garbage out. So if you don't get your recording right at source, then no amount of mixing is going to fix it. Um, there are lots of tutorials for how to approach things. And it, yeah, it's just about listening. And I suppose one, one thing that I do definitely do, even though I say I'm a little bit conservative with my recording techniques, is I exaggerate things. So if I'm using something like an EQ plugin, then I would boost more than I'm going to in the end, or I would cut more than I'm going to in the other end so I can hear the difference. Because actually, when we come to dealing with sound, it's all about hearing difference. And again, if I was going to adjust the microphones, I would make a bigger change than I think I actually really want. So rather than moving them 30, well, I don't know, five centimeters and go, yeah, yeah, I can hear the difference. I'd move them like 30 centimeters, go, okay. So if I go closer, this is what happens to the sound. Or if I go further away, this is what happens to the sound. And then you can make a kind of more refined choice. So at the beginning, make big changes and then kind of gradually refine them, I think. And have fun. Perfect, have fun, brilliant advice. Um, if there are no more questions, then I think we're all good to go. It was nice to see um, so many friendly faces and uh, some familiar faces too. So uh, thanks a lot for for, uh, for joining us. And yeah, thanks, uh, thanks again to Paul and the team. Thanks, Brilliant. Tim. Thank you so much, Tim. Oh, and enjoy your you. weekends, everyone. Yeah, you too. Thank you.